Well, welcome. This is my home, but it's also the hieroglyph of the human soul, and I look very forward to taking a little tour with you all. I'm delighted that you all speak the language, because I feel that a lot of this is very affirming for all of us, because as we know, when art steps in, it's no longer about proving theory or about ideas, it's about the sense that the art is the proof. And what I love about this, because you said that this began on 9-11, 2001, and as we all have questions of, well, what is the nature and purpose of the journey? Why is it so difficult? When we respond with the creative, it's not a binary. It's not for or against. It's what happens here, which is how do we live with these things? Which is why I think today it's important because the story will, I think, as we wander through it, um, some will make a lot of sense. Others, uh, if you have questions, just jot them down and we can talk about it because I'd love to go back and really look more deeply because what's really marvelous here is we have visual philosophy. I mean, we really have this capacity to embody. And since a lot of us have theater backgrounds and uh, the relationship to storytelling, we have a relationship to, well, how did this all begin? How did the hieroglyph of the human soul begin? And it began in a moment of great despair on 9-11-2001, with the questions of the collapse of the binary powers, which we can look at very symbolically, as we know. This fall of the false erections of money and God, the two erections of the great age of Pisces falling to the ground and bringing us to our knees. And when we look at this as art, one of the things we need to do, as we do when we are looking at, at the motives, is why was this done? Where was this done? For what purpose was this done? Why is this in a home? And why is this in a place where we have, for many, many years, for 40 years, had discussion groups every week? And so on 9-11-2001, I'm going to begin by taking us down to the floor so we can begin to see how there's going to be a very ancient narrative. This will become quite fascinating. This is the emergence of Tor. Now, Tor helps us understand that one of the possibilities for our amnesia is that we actually emerge from a type of much more ancient consciousness with a different physiology. And that the myth and story here that starts to reveal itself on what? On linoleum on the ordinary surface, not marble or gold, but on truly the sacred nature of where we live with those we love. Only in this intimacy can we begin to hear the stories of our ancientness because we're not trying to get somewhere. We're finally, as we do here, looking down. And she said that we are looking down 18 and a half million years ago. And the great question was, what if we could enter the questions we were asking? No longer simply hold them, but enter them. And this is where we'll start to journey with the story of Eve that appears here. Why this would make Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung very happy is that I am not illustrating anything I think I know. That the revelation comes by following the energies of the watcher language itself, which I'll show you this rhythmic pattern. But I want you to see here the smaller head and the apple. This gift of the apple, the gift of life which also is the gift of death. And that the point of the smaller head, this idea of the chalice, of the bowl, is that we will have to develop the human library, the human imagination. What was once, as we can see here, do you see with Tor, if we move over there, there we are. We can see how she's going to tell us that our transformation was that we were going to move into the journey of becoming human. And I talked about the watcher language. Well, let's go a little, oh, just over here, on the floor again. And this is the moment on 9-11. I want to show you this. Can you see this? Yeah. When, when I fell on my knees, and, and it's, it really is reminiscent of, of an opera, because it's the falling on one's knees in that moment of despair, and we're visited by my friend. This is Champ. He's going to be with us. He's one of my little guardians. Um, but as we see this elongated figure, this is the watcher figure. Now, I start 
following this language, really like a rhythmic gesture, like a jazz musician, just leaning into the riff. I don't know where it's going, but as it starts to emerge, almost like a resonance field, it starts to suggests the story of what it says is the hieroglyph of the human soul. <laughs> and as I follow this language, this is where we begin to see the first emergence of the archetype of Kuan Yin. As I follow this rhythmic weave, she starts to tell me a story that we are returning home, that we are the outcome of a great question. And that as her being reveals that all of the entity, all of the qualities of sentience and consciousness, like the organs that make up our body, are necessary to the weave of the whole. All are whole and holy. Think again about domestic space telling us this, meaning intimate space. Not where we're convincing one another, but we're on our knees. We're actually able to hear. Now, the, the floor took, uh, I was on my knees for three and a half years. And I feel like in that state, in the child state, in the, in the relationship like an animal to looking down, I was no longer looking away or looking toward. And I began to understand philosophically, this is what is meant when we begin almost like the ancient Druids to see our roots. And that's why, what connects to the floor? Think of the pun, your soul, souls. So as the souls connect by gravity to this story, it begins to tell us that we are rising out of the living waters of eternal possibility and that we will see this direction. You can see the mirror of self-reflection. But we could walk a little bit because I want to create a bit more context so that we begin also to understand that this, like a theater piece, as it unfolded, began to take in the journey because the question of why are we divided? What is this? squaring of the circle, the right angle. What does that mean? And everything in that work, in this work, is essentially an answer or a insight that comes after we have done all the studying. And I think this is very important because as we move toward the journey of why and what is the nature of our deeper mythology, and here we see we could look at this with the blind eye. If you're more comfortable with Odin, it could be Odin. But I see this really as Christ, this relationship of the blind eye of the Father, the knowledge of I think, therefore I am, which as we lift up, we will see moves into the mirror of self-reflection. And this is the knowledge or direction of I think, therefore I am. As we look back down, we will come down and see this egg you see, within our seed, within an alchemical alembic. So on the side of the law, we look over here and we see the open eye. And this is the open eye of love. I love, therefore I am, and I think, therefore I am. The knowledge of the father and the mother, and that as we are born of each, the question, and Alex is actually standing up in the right place, because here we stand in the relationship to self-reflection, and unique identity, and the journey into the question of who am I, but this direction, we can see Sophia. And as she emerged, she started to reveal a story about the great mother, matter, mater, mother, and that in the nature of I love, therefore I am, we begin to discover our ancient story. And that's why in all of this, the possibilities of, of contemplation are endless because we'll see the beauty of Sophia, but we'll also look up here. And I wonder if you can make out the eyes of the serpent, this mouth that is holding the egg. And here we have the mother and the father. And the quality of the mother says, because here we see the ark in front of her womb, and she says, I tell you, you enter and travel universes through wombs, not machines. If it takes you 100 million years to get to the nearest star, you have your physics all wrong. You are in a hologram. There is no there there in a hologram. And then the father says, with the cycles and the Ouroboros and time and the lantern upon the ages, that this is the qualities of both the cataloging and unique conditions with the gift of life 
that is held within the serpent's mouth in the crown of Sophia, because she is going to show us as we tilt down, ours is to blossom. But to blossom is not one of us. And this is where she says, I am the great mother. I love all of my children. I love all of my atoms, atoms and Eves. I'm the knowledge of your atoms. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like your stories, tell better stories. And yours is to blossom. But let's see, what will this entail? And she says, now, can we see this as we move down here? Can you get this, Alex? Do you see the face of the child, the infant, her belly? Well, see here, moving from the mind, again, this beautiful vision of the feminine meaning, the quality of life. We are taught in our culture, the first principle is math. Sophia says, no, the first principle is life. Everything is inherently mathematical because it is uniquely connected to the whole. But it does not come first. What comes first is this relationship, and that's why, now we'll see this. As the story progressed, it went up onto the spines of the books of religion and tradition. And here's where we're going to start to see, again, not because I'm illustrating anything, but like all of us, I wanted to know what is the grail? Why do we struggle so greatly? And what is the point? And what's beautiful about this moment here is that as the story emerged, we'll see this reoccurring theme of the twins, the twin in light and the twin in shadow. And that this yearning, you'll see always this yearning. What this is telling us, is we do not understand this yet because we think it's about the inner child. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the truth of human innocence, meaning the condition of the human being is that we simply cannot remember who we are. We are forced into a state of innocence, but composed of a state of ancientness. And this is why, again, this being in domestic space, in a library, it begins to say that if you cannot put it all together where you live, it's not much of a story. And as we'll see that when we look behind here, we see all the different holy books. There's the relationship of the Bible, of the Zohar, of the Quran. All of the different religions are here. And in the mind of innocence, what is extraordinary, because it was not intentional, you can see the Encyclopedia of Religion. So philosophically, isn't this saying that you want to know what it means to be human? Well, go pick a book, and we pick this one. And I said, all right, you know what? To know who we are, we're going to have to incarnate into all of this. Because if we're not willing to live the question, then we're not honoring it. And I think this is the nobility I recognize now in all of us. We have been willing to live over and over the questions so that finally we, where we live, can put the story together. That the chalice of wisdom is not one book or one tradition, but the truth Sophia relates, which is love with a capital L. My knowledge is I love you. And in love, you begin to see that you are part and parcel of a much greater story. And above her, we'll begin to see this relationship once again of the dreaming self, this cosmic infant. But why this is important is we can think of it as cosmic innocence, meaning that Innocence cannot enter in judgment. It must enter in birth. And therefore, the condition of this eye, this seeing, begins to dream itself. We can see this. It's almost as if you were trying to think yourself into creation. Because if you actually moved, it would all tumble. It's just, it's built on gossamer. And that's the truth, like the tissues in the body. It's the story that we have been building a quality that, again, you see the blossom, we're going to blossom. And it's in the union of the mother of light and the mother of dark. The spherical knowing of the journey and the pyramidal knowing of the structure. To know this is to journey into thought and into love, but to realize it as a blossom is to seek union. And this is why we'll begin to see everything is interactive here. I put my left hand, on the egg or the seed, and I put my right hand on the journey of the serpent and the heron, the story of the ark. But let's look at this physiologically. 
This arc is also the left and right hemisphere. It's looking at the quality of, I think, therefore I am. Well, when I think, I separate. But this is, I love, therefore I am. And when I love, I feel connected. So what is it that finally reconciles this? Is a deeper vision that is not one or the other, but that which finally lifts us up into this narrative of the heron or the phoenix. And again, the idea of the enlarged head. What we see here is that the head are like the head of children, meaning that they are ancient, but they are innocent. And only their faces can enter the egg, because the question is, we're going to change our physiology into a smaller head, which will create what we think of as masculine and feminine, but the qualities of thought and love, so that they will find union through birth and life, and this is the journey of the mother. Now, there's an even greater mystery, because we wonder, well, what's behind this? And this blew my mind, because this will also reveal the narrative of Lilith, the first wife of Adam, she who was rejected. But in this, it's not that she was rejected, it is that she is hidden. And let us think of this as a type of theater piece that says, ah, from love and the journey of blossoming, I am going to have to turn the corner into the mirror of self-reflection. But why? What happened to the goddess? And she's going to say in this moment, do you see, I didn't disappear. I turned myself inward so that you could blossom. And we'll see her face, this beautiful face of Lilith, and the journey on the stretcher bars, the back of the canvas, that which is never seen because we only look at the front. And she's going to tell us that in ancient times, she was the connection to the goddess and direct knowing. And that if she is outward, the pretense that we do not know cannot be embodied. And that's why over the spines of my family photo albums, we'll see here, we'll see this serpent energy coming down, but made up of apples, of course. And the life vitalizing, meaning through generation. Why, why have we gone through generation? And she is going to tell us, so that you could blossom, I, the goddess, sacrificed myself. I turn myself inward, and in this, Adam and Eve became unable to remember who they were. And this is the ideal of taking a cosmic love, big heads and directions to the stars, and cosmologies, and creating a condition where we cannot know, and therefore we have to trust the small fires of intimacy. Think of our primordial parents saying, I don't know if we're going to make it through this night. So therefore, let us look to each other. Let us learn to trust each other. And this, I believe, is the beginning of the transformation of the human ego. And what we're looking at now up on the ceiling and the relationship of the story is that we are completely immersed as in a cave painting. And as we'll look from where you are now to where I am, we can begin to see this journey that will take us up into Phoenix Arise, and this might have to have better lighting on it, um, because as we look up, can we see that very well? Yes. Ah, good, got it. This painting, like the watcher language and like the name of the hieroglyph, the human soul, becomes truly revelatory. This I finished in 1997 after four years, and it's called Phoenix Arise. This is going to become the, in, the hidden narrative of our story as human, that we are each a phoenix. We're not born into time, we're born into creation. We are whole and holy, and that our DNA is actually a artistry of perception and consciousness. We'd call it an art form. And this is important because this allows each of us to say, well, I am not born incomplete, like a piano, I am given an instrument, and these structures are what I am woven of. And this is why the watcher language also is about a weave. Everything being intricate, we think of strings, but this is strings as sentience, meaning that as we follow, like in a rhythmic movement, 
the story of standing before the phoenix arise. And if we tilt down, we can actually start at the ceiling here. Look all the way up. Do you see how the phoenix is up on the ceiling? And we'll start to come down. And, and maybe you can hold the mirror and the parts of the, the painting. Because this will show us uh, the journey that each of us take that begins as on the floor. Can you see this meditating self here? The dreaming self, like we saw in the painting um, that Lilith is behind. Because as one stands here, do you see, we put our feet here. And that as we do, notice as you lift up, we see ourselves. We are the outcome of rising out of the living waters to finally realize in this journey toward unique identity and self-reflection, the creation of an ego, we have finally achieved where we can go no further. That is why this is at home, meaning how do we understand our intimate relationship with these things? How do we live our myths? Why are they relevant? And here it's saying, because in this story, within intimate condition, where people like yourselves and ourselves have gathered for 40 years every week, reading 25 years of theosophy of Jung, the Red Book, reading the Black Book soon. We're going through all of the different storytellers and traditions, and I'm convinced it's about they feel honored here. And that's why they're rising, so that we can put our hands, do you see, in the mouth of the ancestors. And that anyone who stands here is told the same thing. You see me because I'm standing here, but if you were standing here, it would tell you that you were this. That you have reached a point of unique identity and self-reflection. I see that I am me and not you. But part of the philosophical problem we're having now is we think in reflection and everyone feels like there's nowhere to go. A sense of claustrophobia. I see myself and I am not enough. I thought I would see God by this point, but I see me and nothing else. This is actually an indicator in a type of interactive, creative, imaginative instrument saying, do you see the mandala? Do you see your heart? Do you see the truth that above is Sophia, the relationship to love and the mother, the quality of love with the capital L's? Well, think of that as yearning, meaning that we cannot touch her, but we yearn to connect. So when we come down from her, we'll begin to see this journey that is talked about of of the, the, the story of the stone and the shell, the oceanic self and the dark sun within the mind that really like sperm and ovum, that in this unconditioned feminine wholeness and holy life itself will come down to once again visit with the heron, with the phoenix, and once again see this arc of the ancients that we will now stand upon and begin to see ourselves as journeying this great story that reaches a point that says when you can no longer get there, when you think you have to get and touch those people that you see in reflection, when all you do is self critique, it whispers, turn around your home. It is not a matter of more. It is a matter of honoring the truth that you come from a journey that you are embedded and embodied by. And as we turn away from reflection and what do others think, much more toward intimate space and home, back into the library, we ask a question, what do I do to those and for those I love? And this began from my love for my wife, Carla, and my daughters, Brighton and Caitlin, on 2001, as those towers came down, and I think we all fell into despair, there was the question, what do I do? I was brought on to my knees and it said, tell a story, tell a story you can live with and tell it in a way that's not shouting at the neighbor or correcting them because you think they're wrong. We had a fire come to our door with the Woolsey Malibu Park fire. And rather than leaving or running, we stayed. And I say to people, there was a lot. I feel like the captain of a ship. I am not leaving the ship. But I also learned a great deal. We're in a time where the fire is upon us. And the point is about how do we deal with the drought in the human heart. And part of that in this story is not making art for the reflected world, but art as a relationship with the creative process. 
And I tell poet friends of mine, if you have 50 people who read your poets, great, poems, great. But if no one does, then read the poem out loud because those qualities will hear you. That's the silence I have in here. It's not a madness, it's a sense of fullness. And that's why as we walk now from the Phoenix, let's take a look this direction. Because this is going to show us this reoccurring theme here. I think we all wanna know, well, what is the apple? What is the challenge? And as I touched her belly, I realized here was the apple. And as it developed, here was the chalice. And here is the blood. And the question is that the gift of life is the primary gift. And that we see up above Kuan Yin, the return of mind, which has been separated from the body, allowing us not to actually go there, but to create alignment. This studio we're in right now is above my studio below. So we have as above, so below. And we're going to walk over to the other side of the room and look at my tarot because that is downstairs. My 17 years work in black and white on the 22 major arcana of the tarot that revisioned the entire uh, tradition. And I feel like an archaeologist, not by going away from it, by, by going deeper into it, by bringing it home and telling us that our structure of as above, so below was asking us the question of how across the ages do we finally put these things together when they are literally different rooms in the house. So this we talk this way. We begin to move and we can see with the paintings in the mind of an ancient God, these were questions I asked, uh, actually based in, in three nights of lucid dreams, a bit like uh, Scrooge, but in a different way, that took me back to ancient Atlantis and dealt with the writing systems, the politics, and also the three different periods that the first one had no right angles and everything looked a bit like Gaudi. It came right up out of the, the uh, organic nature. And then the uh, planes of high conductivity and pyramids. And this, though, becomes the gathering of ancient memory. And as we look down here, I want to show you. Can you see Splendor? Do you see her? This oceanic mother? Can you get a good? Yeah, do you see her with her wonderful dolphins? Well, she, because as we step to this side, do you see, and look back up, I'll, I'll show, uh, let me just, uh, this, from Splendor, the oceanic mother, in this setting, a bit like a, like a set for actors, and I'm convinced that this is what this is about. All of our ancient sites were about this, that in the same way in theater that your sets, your props, your costumes, and the play keep the imaginative field in agreement, which allows ensemble and allows an amplification of energy that isn't one, but is a cumulative energy. And this is what this is actually getting at, because it's a cave painting. We're coming full circle to a question of, well, why did we take a curve and draw straight lines through it. And it says, because by going through history, by gathering, you were actually exploring this nature we see on the floor of the grail, of the chalice. And that as we see, once again, this relationship of the chalice, and we will tilt up, and I will stand here so you can see over my shoulder. Can you see that? Can you see Christ on the floor? And this because this allows any, each of us to walk in and to realize that I love, I think, I am a phoenix composed of the chalice of living wisdom. And the question then, as we continue, we'll go around this direction, because this is part of the journey into the fifth world, part of the gate that's opening. And I have to say, my, my dear friend Whitley Strieber, I was reading his book, uh, supernatural, and we ended up, the, these fine, fascinating light crafts started showing up on the floor. So I'm very curious about that. But this is also the story of Gaia. And can you see her, or should I take the lights down? Is that okay? Um, because once again, this reoccurring motif of the chalice, the gift of life, the apple being the gift of birth, and the truth of human innocence. So she is, so anyone that stands here puts their hand on her belly. And that as they do, they begin to tilt down. Can you see the floor here? Can you see this? And you start to see the heron and the mother and the infant and the eye of Ra. 
this <laughs> starts to say, as you're going to enter into Gaia, into Earth, you're going to be composed of two conditions. One will be the eye of Ra, the qualities of the eternal, meaning you are a phoenix. But you will also be woven of matter, mater, mother, a unique time, a unique condition. And therefore, the journey, and we can see this is amplified on the books here. Can you go down there? See the infant there? I feel like an archaeologist. And Zenvil is a tomb, and it's very interesting. He enters, but here we have the, the infant and the heron once again, this reoccurring motif of the guardian of the phoenix for each of us, and that we will take this journey because as we look on the floor still, we'll begin to see, we can look at this as Minerva or Athena, but the idea of, of emerging fully conscious with the tree of life and the seed, and also the hummingbird, this reoccurring motif here of, of stillness while in motion. Because as one stands here now, we can start to see this relationship that will lead not as the, the mirror, which is a yoni of self-reflection, but here we have darkness, the mystery of birth and origin. And when one stands here, you do not see yourself. You see yourself as a watcher, entity without unique identity. And the question here, as we can see with the twins once again, this reoccurring motif of the arc of the twins, of the parents, of the apple, that there's going to be a journey of all the different kingdoms, meaning that if we do not honor all of them, we are composed of that which we have forgotten or left out. And I like to put it this way, we don't build spaceships, we build mind ships. It's not about going somewhere else, it's about coherence, about creating conditions where these things like a garden are allowed to grow. And that's part of the condition here, because we're going to look at the relationship of the painting and the heron once again you can see how everything is about journey from the light of being this question of life leads to the phoenix the womb and we see the african eve the first mother that begins to say that our journey will be a adventure of being born you can see here and that the journey everything like the tarot works in a wheel this actually works up from the journey of birth and vision of Kundalini and the goddess, to the birth of unique self into the, uh, the arc of existence. But first we begin directly connected to archetype. We're going to move to this story of mind, the beginning of apple, unique identity, the light of mind and this great journey we will take into the knowledge of the serpent who holds in his mouth the apple, the gift of life and the gift of death. And therefore, she will say, as a phoenix, this ark, this creation, this mother, will allow you to finally emerge here, which is where we see the grail mother. We see once again the chalice and the apple and the book. Now there's books. Now we have a library. And we have twins. And this is the story, once again, of finally bringing back to life the twin qualities of what we think of as the two hemispheres of love and thought, unique identity, and shared reality because the greater wisdom is the love of beauty. And in that we begin to see ourselves not in optical and horizontal ways, but as depth emerging. And that's why, as well, you see it doesn't end, it keeps going and going, um, but this uh, takes us, because the question was, all right, well, why do we leave this, why do we take this adventure of birth? What, what's the point? And this is actually going to say something quite wonderful. And this, do you see these three? I redrew this Egyptian hieroglyph of Gebenut because I wanted to know through my hand what the story was. And you see the erection here is over his umbilical connection. And this is very important because this is actually a, the expression of desire, the yearning, truly a divine erection, yearning to return to the great fullness, but is beginning to fall backward, almost like a dance. It's an intentional fall. And here we can see the right angle, the squaring of the circle, the applying of unique qualities to her absolute fullness. And in this also we see how he is looking what? Toward the horizon. And his arm is bent, he is focusing. So this is the story of ourselves as a unit, meaning that we are composed of qualities that we do not understand, 
really relate to our sensual knowing, not just our intellectual knowing, because this will bring us into the sacred DNA. And before we leave today, I want to show you how my Phoenix Arise painting creates this holographic double helix DNA weave from my painting iterating itself truly in a fractal way. Because this is starting to say that our DNA is a living work of art. And that the relationship here, we'll begin to see, this is my uh, forbidden fruit. It's the delicious knowledge of Eve. My archetype of the sun is actually based on the Vitruvian man of Leonardo. And this is the next iteration, which is, this is in color. And she then returns this third element of the Yoni, meaning what is this? Do you see, we go from the mind and being, being the measure of all things, to once again, the embrace of life, the allowing for the quality that lets this act in unison. Very important because up here we see again, Isis, the winged Isis, uh, uh, with the feathers of watchers. And she's going to actually take us on a journey that manifested here because we'll see as we tilt down, everything here is interconnected. This heron, the picture of the heron at my front door was when I was visited uh, in 2005, on January 30th, for over 40 minutes, by a great white heron that came into my home, and we conversed, and he said that you, you uh, think of me uh, as a symbol, but I'm, I'm more than a symbol, I'm more than a bird, I'm the quality that ascends and returns, and I live in more than one world at a time, and I don't speak to you with words, because I teach you to trust your inner storyteller. Is this the Bennu bird, the inspiration is, of the phoenix? This is the inspiration of the phoenix. The ancient Egyptians, this is the Bennu. This is what's so extraordinary. The painting Phoenix Arise attracts the ancient Egyptian Bennu, the, the, the phoenix, as if to say, yes, the last question of as above, so below wasn't just to become a greater library, but an integrated one. Meaning, how do we integrate? Because that's what allows us to think in terms of generation. My wisdom is not solar centric. It doesn't remain with me. Because this is an environment, it's like a theater company. We begin to grow the imaginative permission that allows these things to occur. And that's why the heron we can see in my art, we've already looked at a number of them. It became like a cave painter for me. It just became a reoccurring motif. And every time it did, it started to show me something different. Now look at what happens as we'll see the heron on my, my favorite chair. So we have the story of the chalice, of the heron, of Thoth. And he's, or it's going to show us this story once again, that as we rise up toward ascension here, this painting of mine, that will take us, as we can see, across the ages in a circular motion, across history, like a great toroidal journey, gathering ourselves. We had to be Roman, we had to be Egyptian, we had to be Hittite and Aztec, because that is just as human. And this is the story that the ascension is not to leave any more than one leaves when they come here. It's to ascend into the library, into the imagination, and not be swept away, but to actually be anchored like an actor, being there for the third act, and not thinking the play's about escaping it, because that's not really very good for the other actors. And this is why this is also my family. You're responsible. And what I love, I was, it's true, you know, get full of yourself. Your wife says, take out the garbage. And I almost feel like this is what creative spirit's going. It's like, take out the garbage, get over yourself. You're not so smart, enjoy it more. And here we have my lovely Puma, which is another story altogether. But she's, she's a guardian that keeps an eye. You can see these are my tarot images, my tarot wheel that I created. And this is also a very good way to understand how we are made. That as we see these images in black and white, we begin to remember the keys of a piano. And as keys of a piano don't have a good key and a bad key or a right key and a wrong key, this is what the archetypes teach. We have to stop composing our worldview based upon which keys we don't like and understand the relationship of the instrument itself. And this is why, as we begin to look into our depth, think of a, the tarot wheel not as a, uh, just a flat wheel, but as a spinning gyroscope. And that as one steps into it, now I'm going to step here with my, my lady Puma. And 
but this is actually a wonderful symbol because she's saying release your inner animal. That the qualities of sentience are the panther in the dark forest, meaning it is all instinct. It is not about what you see. Those are the optics in the mirror. It's what you trust in terms of where you are and who you are. So as ascension, the question is, we take this journey of the wheel of the tarot and we move out into, this is the mandala. This is one of the mandalas that comes from the painting Phoenix Arise. And this as well over here is the Phoenix. I mean, is the DNA once again composed of the Phoenix Arise. Since I'm talking about this, uh, why don't you keep with the camera and I'm gonna go get the cards, I'll be right back. Cause I think I should show you this um, just to uh, make it even stranger, but, um, and we will, we will come around to mothership revelations in pink in a moment, but let me show you this if I can, because this is the relationship. Now also think of this as a fractal mathematical geometrical message. Because I'd love to say I'm so clever I figured this out, but I realized that the nature of genius is, whoops, you don't figure it out, things happen and you actually, it becomes the mentor. It becomes, follow this, ask these questions. So I dropped the cards. And when I dropped the cards is where I saw the DNA. And I began with this. I looked at this painting. You can see this is my painting in card form. Well, when I discovered the DNA, I started playing with the, the cards. And as I did, what was astounding was that a friend of mine's daughter, um, who I was showing this to, I had seen this and I thought it looked a bit like an umbilical cord or a serpent or question mark. And she just had the intuitive, and I thought, oh my gosh, because we know the story of the Phoenix bird of immortality as it returns home after 500 years and builds a nest. And what is the first mandala, the first revelation, the first medicine wheel? It's a nest and feathers, just as in the story. Well, in the story, once the nest was built, it erupted into flames. I pull out the cards, it erupts into flames. And I can't figure out how you would figure out how to figure this out. Uh, so this then, I kept pulling out the cards and look at what will happen. It doesn't just show random flame, it shows a blossom. And as we can see from the first mandala we were looking at, it creates infinite blossoms, infinite mandalas that look like Indian baskets and Indian headdresses. And the Hopi say that the knowledge of the sacred DNA is in their basket weave. So here we have the first and oldest language of painting, which is just paint and imagination, storytelling. But then we have it as a fractal. So suddenly we have the same iteration over and over again, which is actually helping us understand Pythagoras, who said, don't teach fractions to the uninitiated. Two thirds of a dog is a dead dog. We have to speak in whole numbers because that which is of life must hold whole and whole equalities. And that's why the mandala led, <laughs> intriguingly enough, from the watcher language, and this is a whole other story, there was an inundation of orbs in my photographs. And I found over the years that a debate over what something is not is about the greatest waste of time a person can engage in. So rather than getting into a debate, I used my father's advice, who was a painter. He said, when you can't talk about something, paint it. So I started, painting into this large orb, but then she appeared. And this is where we begin to see, how does she look? Can you get a good, yeah. Because when she appeared, the story began to make a great deal of sense, which is she said, I am matter, mater, mother. I'm the knowledge of your atoms. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like your stories, tell better stories. I will remind you now, of why are there so many tears in this human story? Why for this journey, do you see a family over and over again in order to blossom, why has it been so difficult? And only in intimacy, only when we return to that sense of there is no agenda of for or against, but absolutely contemplating the gift of life itself. She says, ah, in this chalice of the gift, we see the twins once again, 
the two infants, meaning these qualities of love and thought, male and female, that are within each of us. And that as she allows us to perceive who and what we are, she says, look up. Now you see in the even greater story of the apple, of the serpent, and of the heron, that we'll start to see the Hopi Kachina. We'll start to understand that these beings, a bit like being the theater, hold us and allow us to engage our story, almost like a canvas. They create parameters that allow us to have conditions. And this is where she says, do you see the chalice here? The knowledge of the blood. Here we have the mother upside down in front of the eye. She's going to tell us. And what I like here is that this is also very physical. A person enters this. You're like this. You feel it. Like a cave painting. You close your eyes. You allow yourself to ask questions. Because the beautiful thing about art is it doesn't insist on being right or wrong. It tries to engage you to feel that your story is of value. So when you stand here, you experience a different story than I do. But what I love is it's, again, the arc of the ancestors and the ancients. And when we look at this entire relationship to the breast, to the womb, it's once again the story that every atom is whole and holy. And that if we come around this way, do you see this with the black hole, the eye, the pupil? Think of a story that we come from pure vision. But as pure vision, the question is, well, we have to take on a body. We have to take on a vehicle. And so as one walks this, we begin to see, oh, this is what happens here. We could actually take the journey toward her and we begin to reach a point where we turn around and we are drawn back out into the story of birth. Now, what is fascinating is because this is spatial philosophy, it's actually telling us it, she is not connected. She's not seen from the other side. What we do see are the mandalas. And this is important because as we come around this corner, the question would be if the room were just black, just dark, and someone said, are you willing to be human? And we'd say, well, what does that mean? We say, well, we really don't know what it means. We can only know if we're willing to become it. Are you willing to become it? Well, there's nothing but darkness in there. I can't do that. Trust, you have to trust. And I'm convinced that we dove into these dark waters over and over again until finally we could cross this threshold and not leave home, be home, but see that we are the outcome of the gathering of this knowledge across the ages. And when we look up on the eye beam, do you see, we see Newt. Once again, like in the hieroglyph below that I recreated, we have Newt spanning the ceiling. And above the wheel, she shows us in her heart, once again, the infant, the question of innocence. And we also see the journey that will take us over to the story that uh, uh, in terms of our magical relationship with things is um, the relationship here of the grimoire, which um, again is a book of magical spells that I created. Um, and the best way to learn about a grimoire is to uh, create one. Uh, because many of the secrets are not uh, knowable. But it becomes really a great ritual. And um, I created this for a friend of mine's film, Elias Marriage for Shadow of the Vampire. But it was seen by Keith Richards and this toured with the Rolling Stones from 2005 to 2007 on a bigger bang tour. And this, these images were projected onto enormous screens. And the night we saw it, Keith Richards, this dissolved. And then there he is smoking a cigarette, doing an acoustic solo in front of this magical grimoire. And to me, uh, we can look at Keith Richards as a modern wizard, meaning that uh, uh, he has scoffed at death more often than not. And our dear friend Stash, who said that uh, many tried to follow Keith, but they're all dead. <laughs> so anyway, this was, this was the grimoire. And in terms of looking into the story now, I'll sit with my friend here.